like Sitecore as a service if you want uh, that way. So like, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> so uh, in production, not everyone knows me. So I'm uh, Alexander Smagin. I'm senior solution architect at DTEM, uh, three times MVP, been working in DTEM for seven years or so. Uh, so doing a lot of like do some blogging, uh, open source projects and so on. So that's information how you could connect. Um, so SAS, like uh, I hope you <laughs> <laughs> uh, happy to see this product over there. So like, uh, let's figure out what is that. So like, uh, Sitecore is gradually moving from on-premise and was only on-premise. On -premise, then cloud was introduced. Like uh, IaaS appears as infrastructure as a service where um, like infrastructure is provided by different cloud vendors like DigitalOcean, Linode. You know, this less of a like kind of applicable for Sitecore because mainly Linux, like AWS, Azure, now GCP, uh, and so on. So in this case, uh, those providers take care of virtualization, uh, underlying infrastructure, while uh, you could uh, create through some interface, you could create VMs. You log in into those VMs, and the experience from there is similar to what you have on your laptop. So that was next stage. Uh, PaaS is platform as a service, like. Uh, in this case, different providers taking more and more responsibilities, uh, and they taken uh, responsibility <coughs> for updates of your software, updates of middleware, runtime, and they providing you with interfaces where you could, let's say, deploy your code, uh, do some configurations of your software, uh, and uh, but you don't have direct access to operating system. You cannot install software on uh, in pass like rather than your your application that you deploy. So examples for that would be like AWS Beanstalk, uh, obviously Windows Azure App Services, um, like Heroku, Force.com, Google App Engine, and so on. So um, SaaS is a next version of like infrastructure, like how in this case, um, software vendors that providing you with different applications uh, they taking care of the whole uh, management of your application, and then you provide them just with login screen, your credentials, and you go in there and you start working with with the software. So, um, in this case, like you're not responsible for any infrastructure; you're just responsible for paying subscription fee, and you just get the service. So, uh, good example of this, like it's again like Dropbox, Salesforce, like they were. Pretty much pioneers in like SaaS offerings, like with their CRM and like additional products that they uh, provided, like Cisco, uh, like WebEx, Concur, like GoToMeeting, and so on. So one thing that is not uh, like addressed on this slide uh, is managed uh, cloud. Um, this is not technically an infrastructure pattern, but that's something that uh, different vendors are doing when they uh, saying like. We are not providing completely SaaS offering because uh, our software cannot really be extended without your code, but we will take care of management of infrastructure for you. So uh, uh, Sitecore Managed Cloud is the uh, example of that. So like, for example, Hybris Managed Cloud, uh, Adobe Managed Cloud, that's the uh, model where they will manage your infrastructure for you and you will deploy code over there. They will help you to restore stuff. Like if something got wrong, but they will provide you with this list like on the basic product and you will be responsible for your extensions. So uh, why SaaS? So uh, like there are different uh, reasons why you would go there. So uh, like ease of use and speed, like if you try to work with Dropbox, let's say uh, creation of an account in Dropbox and start using it, like even installing desktop like uh, application is pretty fast. So you don't need a lot of additional work to set it up. Like if you are an enterprise, like it, yes, it's more complex. You probably need to create enterprise account, connect SSO, but still uh, like there is no like three, four, five months project of setting it up, like configuring infrastructure, you just like enable it, you register your organization, you're ready to build. So flexibility and scalability. So. Uh, that might be like that really depends on like implementation like that's disclaimer here but uh, usually like a good SaaS product will provide you still with uh, like ability to extend uh, their software 
and uh, because they tested on many, many clients and they run in this infrastructure, like they provide you with SLA, so they will provide you with like scalability out of the box. There is not something that you will need to think about it, like at least within the scope of uh, within the scope of the features and feature set of this product, how to scale it. So like in some cases, yes, you can hit limits, but again, so that will be provided as a part of SLA, you will see this limit. Uh, update, uh, great updated features, uh, that's another good part of software, uh, software as a service. Um, in this case, when vendors do not provide you direct access to their software, so they more flexible in the way how they update the software. So like, they do not need to care about uh, one person installing the software on like Windows 8.1, uh, another on Windows 7, another in uh, AWS Beanstalk, another in like GCP and trying different variations of software with different variations of additional applications installed on the creating system and so on and so forth. So they pretty much locking you to one dedicated contract, like how you interface with this application through UI and through APIs and the rest in on that. So like as soon as they have like good uh, DevOps practices to roll out new updates without you noticing, without downtime for you, you should be good. So there is not much that changes. Uh, on the other side, like uh, there is another thing called like versioning of software that happens as well. So like uh, I doubt that like uh, all the software will be able to work around this. There are things happening and like uh, different applications and their APIs going from version one to two to three and they have breaking changes. This will happen. This will require you to update whatever custom code you built on top of this. Uh, so but again, it really depends on use case. Uh, minimization of application cost. This is a huge thing why a lot of big enterprises going for like model where they define in SaaS as a primary uh, like um, primary type of software that they're acquiring. Then they go into things like function as a service and containers, then like PaaS, IS, and then potentially on-premise infrastructure. The reason for this uh, order is following. So if you go SaaS, you do not need to uh, pay uh, for managing of infrastructure that is not your primary, uh, it's not your business. So like you don't need to spend on IT that is not uh, your business differentiator. So that is the reason why they go in this way. So and obviously they just pay maintenance cost for SaaS vendors. They negotiate prices on volume and they go with that, but they do need to care about like maintenance, support of this as part of the package. So when SAS, so again, you see uh, it's summer 22, uh, uh, sorry, not 22, 2020. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, is, it is on the horizon. So uh, like uh, that was like popular joke on Cypress Symposium that everything is on the horizon somewhere uh, in the future. Um, there is a disclaimer in the bottom that barely seen that this is provided and this is a subject to change. So now this disclaimer is visible on like more or less every presentation that's talking about something related to releases of Sitecore because they kind of keep in uh, an option to change things uh, on the fly. But again, this would be initial version. Uh, it's supposed to come next summer. So for whom uh, SAS would be? So uh, Again, as it was briefly mentioned, this would be entirely new platform. So they're not building it on uh, based on existing uh, site core. Uh, they're not building it based on um, style apps, at least like from what we know. Um, there might be different reasons for that. And like, um, let's say like as of now, like site core is more or less monolith application that cannot be easily extended without putting code inside of site core. So like, um, Again, that's my own speculation, but I believe it's kind of close to truth uh, at this point. So um, what will be in the first release? It will be like core content management functionality. So uh, with they claiming that with the subsequent releases, they will kind of match uh, XM version of uh, software and XP, whatever it would be like uh, at this point. So. First release will also provide like foundation for them like running quickly, uh, but it won't be like a replacement for existing customers. So like 
while you still need to build new sites, thinking about the fact that SaaS would be somewhere in the future, and uh, again, Sitecore probably within next few years will provide you better and clearer paths how to align your applications to that. As of now, it's not so clear. So, like, because again, uh, SaaS is on horizon so far, uh, but um, that's that's how it's stated. And uh, for now, taking into account that it's not providing a full uh, experience platform, uh, the best use cases is like lower mid market uh, with like limited digital experience requirements. So it's probably a competition to like smaller vendors doing like headless uh, CMSs uh, that's on the market so far. At least it's supposed to be. And again, that's my own view over here. So uh, what about not <laughs> sex? So, uh, uh, like we, we're not doomed, uh, like at least for the next three, five years, maybe after that situation will change. Uh, that's the uh, that's a plan from Sitecore. They will continue to invest in on-premise platforms and, like, based on market uh, market situation, like after that time, they will decide like what way the best way to go forward. Uh, whether it's to like merge those products, like uh, create a good transition path from one product to another, like kind of like pay for transitions, whatever. I don't know. Uh, they will decide it at this point, but like they try and they will be thinking how to make transition from on premise to cloud as easy as possible. So, uh, how to prepare for SaaS? Uh, again, first thing is a recommendation from Sitecore. Obviously, uh, they will ask you to go and upgrade to the latest versions, uh, which will actually include new UI and Horizon that. Then she will be a part of SaaS platform. Uh, they will also, uh, again, you should also follow closely site for practices. Like they will, I believe they will change and evolve uh, similar to like Helix that is changing, that they trying to address like issues and questions from community in current version, like Helix 2.0, or however it was called, was introduced by Nick Vesselman. So they trying to address those things. Uh, they will, I believe, like going, uh, taking SAS in mind, they will address it going further. Um, like uh, another thing, like if you have a logic that uh, is not really uh, like suitable for Sitecore and you could put this logic in separate services, you should better do that. So uh, this will simplify your life going forward. Uh, that's not like a Sitecore recommendation, but it's like general architecture recommendation, I would say. Um, and like, uh, Additional thing like GSS, uh, like Ed claimed that it's probably not prime time for it. We've been doing it for like two years already. So it is a prime time and it's already decoupled from Sitecore. So APIs and layout services, they might change in the way how uh, how they look, uh, but uh, that would be the way how you interact with Sitecore. So you, your uh, UI layer will still uh, consume those API services and GSS will be doing that. So whether you will write code completely in JavaScript and use like rendering host, or you will use .NET rendering host, that separate question. Uh, it's up to like whatever preferred technology stack you have, but um, it is a way to decouple logic out of Sitecore. Obviously GSS doesn't solve the question of like how to extend workflows or how to change like internal scenes in Sitecore, but at least one problem less for you to think of when you upgrade in Sitecore, that's a good thing to, to have. And that is a pretty much like end of this discussion. So we have references, which are public Sitecore, uh, like SAS strategy uh, and FAQs. Uh, and that's at the end of the presentation. Nice, good job. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There's no question that SaaS is going to be a big change for developers. Like having done Salesforce projects and having done Sitecore projects, very different from each other in how you approach customers. Yes. So yeah, basically because the scene is uh, kind of closed internally, so like you will have additional layer which is usually called like. Uh, Backend for front end. Uh, this is additional layer of services that you put on top and you leverage your like SaaS platform mainly as a like content source uh, rather than like do everything from it. 
Mm -hmm. So on one side, like it's really changing the way how you develop uh, foresight for on another side, it's kind of aligned with all other practices that happening in uh, IT world and like in development where you break breaking down your monolith into smaller functions and you kind of develop them separately, you work on them separately and so on. And then you have like additional components that kind of merge and aggregate different services. So that's kind of aligned with overall markets and like uh, IT trends in general. Just being able to eliminate the whole deployment craziness mm -hmm. that is, or installation craziness that is happening now is a big cost savings for a lot of projects. Oh and my it goodness. started so much faster. 